Jackie Miller, and this is Out of Crazy Town, your guide to divorcing a narcissist. I have the incredible Dr. Nadine Macaluso on this episode, also known as the ex-wife of Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street. Nadine's marriage to Jordan started out as a fairy tale, but ultimately became a nightmare, and now she is using her experience to help others. Dr. Nadine has written a book called Run Like Hell. You need this book to help understand how you can recognize, escape, and heal from a trauma bond. Thank you for joining us. All right, welcome everyone to Out of Crazy Town, your guide to divorcing a narcissist. I have the most incredible special guest today. I am so excited. If you think you don't know Dr. Nadine Macaluso, I'm going to correct that thinking. You do. Dr. Nadine Macaluso's ex-husband is Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street. And so if you've seen the movie and seen Margot Robbie play her, that is Dr. Nadine Macaluso. And she has an incredible story and an incredible journey. And we're going to talk about that today along with her new book, Run Like Hell. So welcome, Nadine. Thank you. So I'm so excited to be here. We work together all the time. And so it's kind of fun to just have fun. Oh my gosh, absolutely. We we get to talk about all kinds of fun things that help our clients. And That's so right. thank you for coming on because I also, after reading your book, it just hit home even more. It's obvious on some levels, but how much your work helps every single one of my clients. Oh, thank you. So what Dr. Nadine has done is obviously she experienced her own journey through a marriage that started off as a fairy tale and it developed into a relationship where she was trauma bonded with a pathological lover, which we're going to talk about more. And if you'll help me explain that to our audience. Yeah, um, of course. And only when that pain became too great and you realized you can't love them enough, you can't fix this, then you left and you have to talk about this in a minute. You left with your kids and your curtains. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, I know. Okay, I love so saying that. I'm going to have you explain the curtains in a second because I've been meaning to ask you that for a long time. But you did a lot of deep, intensive work um, through therapy and then went on to become a psychotherapist and get your PhD. And you're now the trauma bomb whisperer. <laughs> I, I use that term because, you know, trauma bonds are a very tough uh, topic to discuss. So I always kind of laugh that, you know, when I was a little girl, you know, thinking about what I want to do with my life, I wasn't, un, you know, in bed saying, hmm, I think I'm going to be a trauma bond whisperer. No, you know, I, I didn't even know that existed then, but I think it's kind of a nice way to say what I do. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, that's funny you say that because people often ask what I do and there aren't a lot of divorce coaches in the world. And so I always laugh and say, yeah, when I was little, I didn't think, oh, and when I grew up, I want to be a high couple divorce coach. But here we are, but here here we we are, are. right here we are. And we get to help other women, which is so incredible. So first, tell me, tell me why the curtains? Well, I always, you know, I am a writer, so I like alliteration. And so when I left my ex-husband, because of all of his financial issues and his issues with the government and being indicted, the money that we shared was really blood money. And so the government took it and I didn't want any of it anyway, mm. because it seemed so tainted. And also I just couldn't live with myself if I had that money yeah. and they would have come after me for it. And so I just said, you know what, I'm going to leave this marriage, of course, with my beautiful kids. Sure. And I got to take some furniture. So <laughs> that's where the curtains comes in. I love it. It's so funny. So, well, let's roll in now that we've mentioned the term trauma bond a number of times. Would you explain this? Because I have a couple of comments I want to chime in on, but it's so important to understand because as you know, with this audience, your information is so important because one of the first things I did and they and, and anyone who listens to this podcast needs to do is go educate themselves on what the yes. hell happened. Yes. So what is a trauma bond? Yeah. So a trauma bond is a toxic dysfunctional relationship between two emotionally connected people. That's it on its very basic level. But there have to be two conditions for a trauma bond to exist. And the first one has to be a power imbalance between the couple, the two people. And so what that means is that one partner usually has the power. And when you have power, that means you can influence people, right? You can influence someone. And they also have a lot of the decision-making capacity in the couple. 
And so there usually there has to be a power imbalance between the couple. And unfortunately, what happens is the one pathological person abuses their power. The second thing for a trauma bond to exist is something called intermittent abuse. And so a lot of people make this uh, mistake. The abuse is not cyclical. It's not a cycle of abuse. Mm-hmm. What it is, is it's intermittent, meaning you never know where it's going to come from. And the abuse is usually intense and probably occupies about 65 to 75% of the relationship. But then the kindness, the love bombing, the flattery, the good sex is about 25 to 35% of the time. So actually what the research shows is that intermittent abuse bonds us more to a lover than just straight kindness. So you have to have the intermittent abuse with the power imbalance. Those are the two conditions that must be there for a trauma bond to exist. Okay. So, and when you say the power imbalance, yes, some things come to mind immediately. Financial abuse, isolation. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. And so, so the power imbalance, the person who has the power then starts to use the tactics of coercive control, right? So then they start to intimidate, dominate, bully, threaten, insult to elicit fear in the partner, right? So that's another way to gain power is to bully and dominate, to elicit fear and to elicit self-doubt in the partner. So the power imbalance, then they use the manipulation tactics of coercive control that's mixed in the intermittent abuse and that causes the trauma bonds. And so, you know, I explain it like that, but you can see it's very complicated. It's psychologically complex. And that's why I get so annoyed you know, when people are like, why didn't you leave? Well, well, it's just, it's not that simple, as you can see, just by its definition. Yeah, right. Just by its definition. Absolutely. And, you know, thank you for explaining intermittent because you're right. It, that makes perfect sense. It's not necessarily a cycle. It can happen at any time, any component of that. And, you know, it took me a while to grasp this, to your point of it being complex. And if that was really happening to me, and, you know, the thing that I likened it to, and you tell me if I'm on the right track here. When there was silent treatment and put downs and anger outbursts, then when the nice came, I literally felt this rush almost like a high because the yes. relief was so great that it was it, yes. it was like overwhelming in a good way, like a drug. Yeah, well, and that's another very tricky piece of it is that your abuser becomes your soother. Mm, that so, gives me the goosebumps. So, and it, yeah, your abuser becomes your soother. So you kind of rely on them for relief, which keeps you even more bonded to them. And what's also super important to illuminate is that it's the extreme intensity of both behaviors, there right? The extreme love, love bombing, sex, makeup, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, mixed with the extreme abuse, right? Mm-hmm. They're not just like low level experiences of feelings. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And so then you often use the term pathological lever, or you'll shorten it even to PL throughout your book. And so how does that fit into this whole scheme? So, you know, the thing with uh, modern pop psychology is that, you know, we throw a lot of terms out there, you know, narcissist this, narcissist that. Well, narcissism really does not define the person who's the uh, abuser in this trauma bond. And so I use the term pathological lover because pathological means mentally unwell. Mm. So anybody who's going to abuse, insult, control, and manipulate you and deceive you is probably mentally unwell. You know, they don't say they are. We don't necessarily view them as that because we're not educated. So that's why I use the term pathological lover because you're living with a mentally unwell person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So it's an all encompassing phrase that makes so much sense because there are so many things going on. And I know, you know, even in the subtitle of this podcast, they say divorcing a narcissist because that I think has become the term that we should be yes. saying almost pathological lover for yeah, in this context. Yeah. And, right. And sometimes I'll even use the word narcissist just so I can um, appeal to mainstream or imply what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to get like lost in the words, but it's much deeper than a narcissist. The narcissist is actually the lightest of who they are. Wow. Okay. So go into that. Who else are they? Yeah. So they're so complicated. And (laughs) I mean, I'm laughing, but it's not funny because when I think of how complicated a person like this is. Sure. So they usually have a cluster B personality disorder. 
which falls under narcissism, antisocial personality disorder, borderline or histrionic personality disorder. And so as a therapist, we describe people with those personality disorders as dramatic and erratic. And there's even been talk about not even calling them personality disorders, but calling them interpersonality disorders because of the people they affect, right? So they have a personality disorder, one of those, you know, or a mix of them. The second thing is they usually have some psychopathy. And even psychopathy is broken down into two different levels, uh, psychopathy number one and psychopathy number two. Psychopathy number one is more like the grandiose narcissist. And then psychopathy two is more like the vulnerable narcissist, you know, and then we go into the dark tetrad, which is a whole nother layer, which includes narcissism and psychopathy. But then you have Machiavellianism, which these men slash people are highly Machiavellian, meaning they are manipulation experts. The fourth one is sadism. They don't all have sadism because sadism literally means you enjoy seeing people that you love hurt. I'm not saying they all have that. Right. Then we go deeper. They usually have a compulsive behavior, like a process behavior, like gambling or sex. Mm -hmm. Right. Then they're highly antagonistic. That's why they cheat, because they can't control their impulses. They just always want to feel good. Now let's go. They even could have a mood disorder such as major depression or bipolar. So you see like how incredibly complicated this personality is. But at the core, at the core of the personality is hostility and antagonism. Okay. That's what it, they all have in common. They're hostile, angry, antagonistic, selfish people. And, you know, I had never heard dark tetrad until I started watching your work and studying your work. Um, so that is so helpful because it is often a combination of things. And yes, I will often yes. tell clients like, okay, these people all follow a similar script, but I call them idiosyncrasies, but that's a better word. They have their sort of, you know, special corner that that, that they occupy, yes. like the Machiavelli. I can't even say. Yes, it. Machiavellianism. No, it's Machiavellianism. Me. That's a tongue twister. Trust me. <laughs> that's a tongue twister. But it makes so much sense because I was attributing a lot of those traits, you know, to nar just narcissism or whatnot. And the reason I'm getting again so technical, and I alluded to it earlier, because. I do think it's so important to educate yourself on what the hell went on so you yeah. can move on. And what are your thoughts as a therapist on that? Oh, yeah. I think education is the key to empowerment because you have to remember, and you know this, when you're living with a pathological lover, they're blaming you the whole time. They're victim blaming you. They're gaslighting you. They're manipulating. They're twisting your mind, right? So, so it's very important to know who they are because you almost have to know who they are to believe that you're not the crazy one. Good point. And, and narcissists, listen, they're, they're selfish. They're obsessed with their image and they can be deceptive. But not, not all narcissists are psychopaths, right? Mm -hmm. So so that's why this person has its own nuanced behavior. And I just, I know it's not like pretty and the terms are tough. And writing chapter two of my book, I think I cried for like three months because it was so dark to write about that personality and be in it mm -hmm. there. Um, it was the hardest chapter to write, but I did it because... I want the women to understand this is who you're dealing with. It's not your fault. Abuse is always the fault of the abuser. Absolutely. And it's, you're right. There's so much shame around it and not understanding what happened. And that is why I love your book because it is written in terms that are so easy to understand. And like you said, because the, the concepts and the different personality, you know, components of their personalities is so complex. And so it really boils it down and then examples that you give. Yeah. Yes. And and every example in my book is from a real life story. Yeah. I bet. I bet you have lots. <laughs> That's, you know, that from my patients, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, the names are changed and, you know, they're mixed in with other people, of course, for anonymity's sake. Sure. But that's the sad part. I mean, I couldn't even make half that shit up, by the way. No. So it had to come from women who have suffered through this this severe course of control and abuse that, you know, they just thought they were falling in love. I just thought I was falling in love. I had no idea. I mean, I'm 55. Okay, let's say 25. What is that, 30 years ago? I had no idea 
And even when I left my ex-husband, nobody was even talking about these terms, right? So yeah, it's it's really important because there is so much shame and self-blame. Yeah. And it's, you know, I always say that everyone that's on this journey, it's kind of like, this is a weird comparison, but it's kind of like 9-11. I, and the reason I say that it's a major event, right? Where you yes. know where you were when 9-11 happened, right? Everyone can yes. remember that. Yes. Everyone can remember when the light bulb went on, when they were like reading a book or watching yes. this podcast. Or for me, it was four in the morning and I stumbled on a woman who had written another book and you were like, oh, yes. that's what I've been dealing with. Yeah. 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 My life, my life bulb when I was with my ex was he was doing so much drugs. Oh, I, I think I missed, I, I missed substance addiction in my description. Oh. I know there's seven, but I missed that one. Yeah. He was Big doing one. drugs and we went to see a drug counselor and um, to get him to help him get sober. And then, of course, we had an appointment the next day. Of course, he didn't go back. I did. And she looked at me and she said, if you don't leave this man, you're going to get cancer. And that was it. My brain went, whoop. Yeah. It will make you sick. Yeah. It's, this is making you sick. Like this toxicity is making you sick. Um, I felt exactly the same way and how profound and in how long was it before you left him after that? Like, did it take you a while to process that? No, because I'm the type of person. If you give me information, I run with it. Probably like not in the brightest way, not in the most strategic, but that was so shocking when she said that to me. And so I went home and right that day and said to my ex-husband, like, if you, if, if you do not get sober, I'm leaving you. Yeah. Yeah. And he went crazy through, you know, through my clothing and jewelry in the fireplace, lit them on fire. And it, it was pretty violent after that, but he did get sober. So first of all, um, never tell somebody you're going to leave them when they're not sober. That mm. was my mistake. I did that, but I didn't know again. And I really had nobody guiding me. I was in therapy at the time. But my therapist wasn't really guiding me, you know, through that. And, you know, by the grace of God, I'm okay, because that got pretty violent, but he did get sober. But at that point, I left him a year later, because I was just done. But that sure. was, but, but that woman saying that to me, you know, and I know it was harsh, but I'm forever grateful to her was my wake up. Absolutely. And I'm sure you've come across it in your practice where you've probably had to look at women and said, uh... yeah, yeah, I don't say that. <laughs> Yes. Right. I think that's a bit extreme. <laughs> um, but what I, you know, I, I keep feeding my patients information. And I always say, I say this in my book, you know, your decision to leave is yours alone. You know, next week you might come in and say, you want to stay. I'm going to go with you on that, even if I don't agree with it. Right. Because these women have had their autonomy and agency taken away in their decision making capacity. So I would not be doing my job if I went in and said, them, this is what you're going to do. And this is when you're going to do it. And, you know, you and I have spoken a lot about how we work with our clients slash, slash patients. You know, how much do we lean in and give them information and support? And then how much do we lean out? Because as you know, it is a very personal decision. Yeah, you're right. And you know, I was on a show recently with an attorney that was interviewing me and she said, how as a coach do you get them, you know, to realize that they need to do X and need to do Y? And I said, I don't. Right. <laughs> I said, they have to get there on their own, like you said, and, and hopefully they've sought out help. You know, mine is specific to coaching right. and moving forward and divorce, right. obviously, and yours is therapy, but you're right. They have, you have to get there on your own because you can't force anyone to do anything or it won't, won't happen. No. And a lot of times there's finances and kids and health and homes and there's a lot of other things at play, right? Again, it's, there's layer, layers of complexity. So my job as a therapist is to meet my patients where they are. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then facilitate their process. Sure. My next question has to do with looking backwards, but then healing and looking forward because we can look back and see red flags before say even your wedding happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, you're married. And, and in fact, one of your TikToks or Instagrams that I absolutely love, and I think it just popped up again recently is in the movie when you and Jordan go to dinner and he's married, but he's yeah. invited to this gorgeous woman out to what <laughs> looks like a romantic dinner. And you're like, what are we doing here? Aren't you married? Yeah. Yeah. Red flag. yeah. Well, yeah. And you know, the thing is that again, it, that's that Machiavellian piece where he had paid someone to take me to dinner. And I remember saying to the girl, like, isn't he mad? She's like, what do you care? I said, I don't care, but I think it's weird. Yeah. You know, even at 22, I knew that was weird, but she, I was like, okay. You know, cause that was just my naive idiocy. 
Um, and then, of course, you know, he was separated. Right. <laughs> oh, of course. Right. Of course, he was separated, but maybe not really. But to me, he was. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. You know, I have to tell you this story, and I've meant to tell you it for years. <laughs> and it is, and I just always forget. But so let's see, Wolf of Wall Street came out, what, like 2013? Yeah, 2000, yeah it's 10 year anniversary. Oh. Oh my God. 10 year anniversary. Okay. So let's see. I was married in like 2001. I got divorced in, or I filed in 2018. So 2013, I go with my husband to see that movie and we find out that Jordan lives in our community, which I didn't know. Cause why would you talk about that? Unless a movie came out about him Right. and we were walking down the street and he says to me, Oh my God, I love that movie. That movie is so fantastic. That fucker is living my life. No. And you know what scene he was talking about? Which one? Did Jordan, was this scene true? I've been meaning to ask you this. When he rents the 747 for, is it his bachelor party? And there's hookers and cocaine. Oh, and- yes, yes. I mean, I wasn't there. Right. You know, so I don't know, but I'm sure that was true. Yeah. I, I just remember, I just remember, you know, when he came home from his bachelor party, because it was for a weekend, and I was like trying to talk to him because I, I didn't know what happened. He couldn't even right. speak. Yeah. Could, and I was just like, oh my God, like, aren't you excited to see me? You've been away all weekend. But clearly he was recovering. And I'm sure that that's true. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I just thought, wow, my husband. <laughs> Yeah, that's frightening. He's jealous of a man who had hookers and cocaine on a private jet and on his way, on to, way Vegas. to Vegas. Yeah. And that's his idol. <laughs> and he admitted it. That's the, that's what he, that's ridiculous part. Like, at least keep that to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. He admitted it. So now, now that we're looking back at red flags that happened both before yeah. and, and during a marriage, what can women do to heal on this journey? Is there hope? Oh, yeah. I mean, there are days when, you know, I mean, depression, shame, hopelessness, those are all very normal responses and symptoms after you've been through this. I mean, that's just, you know, a, a few of the symptoms. And yeah, there's there's a lot of hope. There's, there's, there's always hope, you know, but here's the thing is that you have to really get connected with a trauma-informed therapist or a therapist, at least who's an expert in this, you know, if you're blessed enough to be able to have a divorce coach like Jackie, that's amazing. Even if you're getting divorced, a lawyer who's an expert in trauma bonds, because it's a whole different landscape, you know, but the first thing is after you leave is to stabilize because you have been traumatized. Mm. And so you have to stabilize through self-care and being resourced with the right people and then once you do that, it's a process. It wasn't a 10 day walk in it, and it won't be a 10 day walk out. But luckily today, there are so many trauma informed therapists mm. and we know so much more about how trauma impacts the mind and the body that, you know, maybe you didn't want to go to therapy for this reason, but therapy is never bad anyway. And of course, if you take the time to heal and practice what you learn, right, and are open to receiving new information about yourself, because anytime you've gone through something tough is is a chance to look at yourself. Now, I'm not saying it's your fault at all, but you can look at yourself. And I think, you know, an examine life is what leads to a hopeful future. And I was just going to say that you have to look at what is within your control and what is right. within your control is, I, I hesitate to use the phrase, what part did I play in it? But what things about me attracted this person? Yes. What things about me did I choose to ignore? You know, and obviously yes. with a the therapist, what things in my past led up to that moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so to me, it's all about control because as you pointed out, this person was in control. That's what they like. That's yeah. what they have to have, right? That's right. That's right. And yeah, and learning about your personality, which, you know, maybe you didn't set good boundaries enough. Maybe you didn't know how to say no. You know, maybe you are a highly agreeable person. And the thing about these men is that and I write this in the book is that women that are agreeable and conscientious, meaning they're pro-social women and their life is based on relationships and they're disciplined and have an integrity oriented life, which are all beautiful qualities to have in the hands of the wrong people get weaponized and turned against you. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's really important to learn about your personality and who you are and say, you know what? 
I like this, but I don't want to keep it. I don't have enough of this. I want to integrate it, right? And also, you have to have a lot of self-compassion. You have to self-compassion. The research shows this isn't just me. This is all research. You have to be compassionate towards yourself as you heal. And what does that mean? Does that mean just forgive yourself of your, of your, you know? Yeah, self-compassion, the research has shown, is that you have to say, I have suffered. The world suffers. Everybody in the world suffers. So there's a there's a link with humanity. I must speak to myself as I would a good friend, right? Like not saying you idiot, why the why the hell did you tolerate that? Just more like you know that was really hard, and yeah. maybe you need a day of rest. Yeah. Maybe you needed uh, uh, two hours of silly TV. You know, don't keep criticizing and shaming and blaming yourself because some but that's already been done to you. Now you can take a account, certain accountability, but shaming, blaming, and criticizing yourself and speaking meanly to yourself will will really thwart your healing. That's such a good point because even though I'm coaching in a divorce setting, oftentimes, yeah. as you can imagine, we'll end up with a real emotional session. Um, you know, we start out, let's talk about your next meeting with your attorney. And next thing I know, we're talking about things like that. Yeah. And I am not a therapist and I repeat that from the mountaintops all the time. But what I do talk to people about, which is when it comes to moving forward, try to start being really aware of when you're talking negative to yourself. Yeah. I mean, you, it takes work. It's like doing sit-ups. If you want washboard abs, you, exactly. have to, you have to do the sit-ups. Yeah. There's no way around it. So to stop yourself in that negative talk, you have to notice when it's happening first. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then I use sort of the example of pretend seven year old you. You're mm. telling seven year old you this. So, seven year old Jackie, what I ever say to seven year old Jackie, what an idiot. <laughs> Why would you? And that's beautiful. That's most exactly of these people right are yeah. incredible parents. And so they just go, oh, so I would never talk to my seven-year-old that way. And then, you know, why are you talking yeah, to that makes, that, that makes That makes it real, very real for them. Or I'll often say, you know, you're bringing that five-year-old along with you. Yeah. Right. And, or if they have a hard time standing up for themselves as an yes. adult, I'll say, you need to think of your inner five-year-old and protect her because you owe it to her. Yeah. Yes. So that inner child's work, I think is, is a really great example. It really how, is. And so, I did do a meditation yeah. once where I, a guided meditation where I went back to little Jackie and oh my God, Nadine, I cried my eyes out for hours. I believe it. Oh, I, mean, I, I cried. believe it. Yeah. It was, uh -huh. it was intense stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's so important. Yeah. To really treat yourself with that, with that kind of kindness. You're absolutely right. Completely right. And, and, and it's great that, you know, you gave yourself the space to process and release those emotions because they have to be released because if you repress them, repress them, repress them, that's what causes anxiety and depression. So you're blocking your growth. You need to feel it to heal it. And so that was great that you did that. And that's and accessible yeah. to everybody. Everybody could go online and get a guided med internal child meditation. That's where I got it. I just yeah. was on YouTube and I got it. And it, it was, it was, I just stumbled on it and it was so profound and so healing. And another thing that I discovered, and you mentioned it a second ago, was my boundaries, which often many of us um, have, have struggled with that ended up with personalities and relationships, marriages, where they're like, Oh, this person doesn't have boundaries. I'm assuming okay. Jordan, I'm assuming my ex were like, oh, there's yeah. a big target on well, your no back. Right? Boundaries there. No. I struggled with it so much. I started to realize these sort of green flags that I have for people that were like, Oh, there's somebody, you know, that you can abuse. But what I also discovered about boundaries is because I met someone who everybody likes, who's really outgoing, really gregarious. And they also have really good boundaries. You would never mess with this person. And this person told me they've never had anxiety. Now they said they've had stress. They've had, you know, but not, they've watched their loved ones have anxiety. And we talked about it in depth that day. And my conclusion was their boundaries are so strong that they never have to worry about if someone's going to do something to them, if something's going to, yeah. you know, happen to them that's out of their control. And I think I, old Jackie used to think to have boundaries, I'd have to kind of be a bitch. Yeah, sure. And you don't. No, no, you don't. You don't at all. And, you know, I didn't really realize I could have boundaries till I was 31. And I didn't know I could say no till I was 31. It's, it's very empowering. Um, because it's really a part of your identity. And that person might not have had anxiety because when you're authentic, you're just authentic and you're just, you're living your life as, as who you are. So you're not overthinking, you're not ruminating, you're very clear and life ironically, even though boundaries feel scary is much simpler. 
That's what I'm trying to say, Nadine. Thank you. Yeah. Life with boundaries is so much simpler and people appreciate you and respect you more if you yes, have boundaries. Yes, yes, Yeah, yeah. Because not people don't know what we think. People don't know what we want. So we have to be adults and clearly state it. And I always tell my patients is that, you know, when you say no to somebody or you disappoint some somebody, it's your work to tolerate this discomfort that you feel, right? By saying no. And, you know, a lot of times when I was younger, I'd be, I think oh, I'm going to say no. I'd think about it for two days and I'd say no. And the person would be like, okay. I say, oh my God, I can't believe I wasted two days worrying about what they were going to say when I said no. So the more you practice it, you realize the world doesn't collapse and life goes on and actually goes on better. And the relief you feel when you said no to something you really didn't want to do. And you're right. You say that no, 99.999% of the time they're like, okay, like you said, nobody gives a shit. But yes. Nobody gives a shit. And I think, okay, let's look at the alternative. You say yes. Now you're stressed because you have to do it. You didn't want to do it. Yeah. yeah it just, it just muddies the waters. It muddies the waters. So these are all things that, you know, you get to learn that make your life better and healthier. Yeah. Right. When you've gone through torturous relationships, you know, not everybody wants to make meaning out of their suffering and that's okay. Hmm. Right. I, I, I might not personally agree with it, but I understand that that's okay too. Cause we don't want to have toxic positivity and just be every cloud has a silver lining. No, maybe, maybe not always, but it does help if you can open yourself up to making meaning out of your suffering. But either way, even if you can't make meaning, get to therapy, get to work on yourself, get to know your personality. Because guess what? You never want to go into this again. Th so that's... that's the number one way to make sure that you don't enter into a trauma bond again, is to get educated. And thank you for saying that because yes, uh, I'm sure the conversation comes up with you a lot of times. It's like, am I going to fall in love? I'm so terrified. I'm going to, you know, date this person again or find this person again. And it's a very real fear, but right. You have to do the work. Very real. But if you do the work, it's more about not you trusting others. It's more about you trusting yourself to make the right next decision. And there, listen, mistakes, failures, rejection, inevitable. Yeah. That's just life. But if you trust yourself to make the right decisions, it's it's much safer to enter into the new territory of dating. Absolutely. So all of that to say, there's 100% hope. That's interesting that you mentioned the phrase toxic positivity. I've heard it before, but I didn't truly understand it, Nadine. Yeah. It's kind of like spiritual bypassing, you know, like we also have to embrace how painful these things are, right? We can't just skip over them with rainbows and unicorns and butterflies. Right. Right. And I have one last question for you. I ponder this often. The concept of forgiveness. I don't like the word forgiveness personally, and I want your your take on this. But sometimes when I get in conversations with people like this that do believe in, quote, forgiveness, we end up that we're, we're actually talking about the same thing. We just come at it from two different ways. I don't believe forgiving people who have done awful, awful things. But what I do believe in is you heal yourself and you move on and they become a, they no longer occupy real estate in your mind. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Forgiveness is a tricky term, especially to use that with someone who's just come out of a trauma bond. And I read something recently, I forgot it was in the New York times. And I really like what this woman said. She said she was, she used the word integration instead of forgiveness, which integration is really kind of what you were describing is integrating your experience, integrating who you really are, like integrating it into your life so that you can become a better person. And then what you choose to do with that other person, you know, that's, that's just a very personal thing. That's up to you. I love it. Thank you so much for that word. That that's so helpful because I guess that's what I've been doing is searching for a word. Yeah, you know? I just read it. I just read it last week and I actually sent it to my social media people. I'm like, we need to do something on this. Awesome. Please do something on it. And speaking of, you guys can find um your website is drnae.com, D R N A E dot com, yeah. correct? Okay. Yeah. Um, Instagram, you have awesome Instagram posts and TikTok posts, which I absolutely love, which are everything from I think you recently have one that's like, what's truth and what's fiction in the movie? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. So that's fascinating. And then obviously really awesome educational things as well. Um, and so IG is the real Dr. Nadine. Yes, correct. Okay. okay. And which I love because audience, this is what I love about Dr. Nadine. She is so real. 
She is just <laughs> real. You so often say things that will catch you off guard, but I think, thank you for saying that because you're just, you're so honest. It's amazing. It's the Brooklyn. It's the Brooklyn in me. <laughs> That's what it is. It's so refreshing. We need more of it. And uh, TikTok is Dr. Nay LMFT, correct? But yeah, this has been so wonderful. Thank you. I really appreciate it. But most of all, you guys, you can pre-order her book on Amazon right now, Run Like Hell. Yes. And it comes out when? January 9th. Okay, January and 9th. Hold the date because January 11th, I'm going to have a party in the South Bay. Oh my God. Okay. It's on my calendar. I'm putting it yeah. in right now. So exciting. You guys, this book is, I, I I was fortunate enough to get the glimpse at it before, before it comes out. So educational, so validating. So it, it's what you truly need to help heal, help move on. In addition to what Dr. Nay said, get therapy with a trauma informed therapist, get all the support you can. I say that all the time on the podcast, but thank you so much for joining me. Welcome. Okay. So I will see you soon. Hey everyone, it's Jackie Miller. Just a reminder to hit that subscribe button so you do not miss any more episodes of Out of Crazy Town.